Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurveda healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. It's great to have you back with me here today on this Total Wellness Tuesday edition of the Cabral Concept. And looking forward to answering the question of should you skip breakfast once and for all? So there's a lot of diet plans out there right now that are telling you to fast through breakfast and wait until lunch for your first meal. Some are even telling you to go all the way until dinner and simply have one meal per day. Well, what I would like to do today is show you both sides of the story, show you why you may not want to skip breakfast as well as when it would be okay to or even for how long. And then, of course, I'll give you follow-ups on that if you want to dive deeper into the subject. So this is one of the most important topics in nutrition right now because some people are telling you to skip breakfast, some aren't. And for those people that are telling you to have breakfast, it's absolutely made up of the wrong type of foods and macronutrients. Of course, this is guaranteed to offend some people. But remember, the work that I do, the content that I try to produce, the education I try to get out there to the world is never meant to offend anyone. And if you're offended by the work, always think about Is this a dogmatic belief of yours? Meaning that are you open to other sides of the story? Are you after the truth? Because if you are, then you should not have any biases as to what has to be right rather than what truly is right and what is. So there's a couple things that we need to get in right off the bat. This is super important because you can't even answer the question if you should skip breakfast or not unless you understand the phenomenons, the actual biological chemical happenings in the body that take place when you first wake up. And that's what I want to go over right now from a real world perspective. And the first one is this. So we have something inside of our physiology called the dawn phenomenon. Now, you've heard me talk about this in many different ways, but just from a different standpoint. And that's simply that in the morning, we should get our highest spike of cortisol between 6 and 8 a.m. So it will vary based on when the person's waking. It will based on be based on sunrise. It will be based on when the person goes to bed the night before. But it absolutely is typically between 6 and 8 a.m. And again, it might be a little later during the winter, a little earlier during the summer, depending on the sunrise. But This is when our body naturally begins to produce the most amount of cortisol. Now, cortisol, you might have thought is a bad thing. That's the fight or flight based hormone. That's one of those, right? And we've talked about that before in the show. But it is a absolute natural part and a must have in terms of our physiology. Without it, we wouldn't feel like we've woken up in the morning. So about 4 a.m., our body starts to produce more thyroid hormone. It starts to produce more cortisol. Our testosterone levels begin to rise. DHEA begins to rise. All these hormones are basically greeting us for the day so that we wake up with the greatest amount of energy that we can. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you have more of your energy later in the day, It does not mean that you were made differently than other humans. It means that there is an absolute dysfunction of what's called your diurnal rhythm. It means that you may be producing more stress hormones later in the day, namely cortisol, rather than earlier in the day. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is a broken diurnal rhythm, which just means basically two times the day. We have a high point the first time, half of the day. When humans meant to be up, working, moving, and the second half of the day, it would be lower. So I I wrote about this in the rain barrel effect. I showed you the different curves, but basically cortisol, our fight or flight hormone, rises between 6 and 8 8 a.m. That's going to be its peak, its zenith. And then it will start to slowly fall all the way till about noon. And then at noon, your cortisol will only be about 30-40% of what it was upon waking, about 20-30 minutes after waking. That's our highest peak or or should be our highest peak. And then around, well, four or five o'clock, we have about 50% of what it was at noon. And then before bed, it should be at at its lowest possible peak, another 50% or lower of what it was at five o'clock. So why this is absolutely imperative 
is if your cortisol is high at night, your melatonin levels will be low. And that means you will not get a good night's sleep. That means you will not be able to rejuvenate the body in the same way. Melatonin is also a very powerful hormone in terms of the anti-cancer effects that it has on the body. It's a very powerful antioxidant in its own right. And it works with the neurotransmitter serotonin, which leads to those happy, feel-good feelings. The reason why I'm explaining this to you right now is that everything in our body, it works like clockwork. It has these natural ebbs and flows, highs and lows. And what we try to do in this thing that we call biohacking or we call trying to manipulate the body is that we try to actually throw off what the body already knows how to do. Or we try to force it to do something that it was never meant to do. Whenever we do that, you can guarantee yourself it's a recipe for disaster. The problem is you can sometimes feel great in the short term before you eventually break down. And one of those things is breakfast. And that's why I want to talk about breakfast right now. The dawn phenomenon that I was getting to is this. As cortisol levels begin to rise, norepinephrine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, just basically those are our other stress hormones along with cortisol, begin to rise. Aldosterone, one of the hormones that also affects our blood pressure, again, begins to rise. We see that in people with higher blood pressure. Theirs is abnormal upon waking. And then it can also be high before bed for different reasons. So when we look at this, we say, okay, the body's ramping up its resources to start the day. And that's because we are not nocturnal beings. So just before you know, we had all this light electricity and all that, we would be going to bed at an earlier time after dark and we'd be waking up with the sunlight, right? So we get in about 12 hours of day and 12 hours or so of night. Let's say six o'clock, seven o'clock, it's dark. And then we're waking up six, seven o'clock in the morning or so. So again, we have light. Humans, they're not nocturnal, right? And that's how they were lived for millions of years before we were even what we are today. And then we would, again, stay out of the way of the other animals that are nocturnal at night before we had all this shelter and light, et cetera. So what, our bodies still operate that same way. Now, think about this. As your stress hormones begin to rise, your body needs fuel. Well, what is the fuel for the body? No matter what anybody tells you, the fuel for the body in terms of stress and that rise in stress hormones is glucose. It's not fat. Now, again, part of it, percentages are for sure from fat. Your body will burn fat. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's meant to do that naturally. And it's not ketones. It will only use that in survival-based states. So what our body is naturally looking for in the morning is some type of glucose. Now, here's the thing. Whether you eat any carbohydrates in the morning or not is up to you. But do know this. Your body will break down glucose one way or another. It will find a way if those stress hormones are high enough in the morning. And again, we call this the dawn phenomenon. It's well known. They teach this in medical school. No, no one really remembers it, but it's called the dawn phenomenon. It's, it's typically, I'm going to get to one more. It's called the Samoji effect. We'll talk about that in a minute. And both of these we, we know for sure, and they're definitely known with diabetics, but th- it happens in all people. The dawn phenomenon literally happens in everyone. So what happens is this thing called glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis, without getting too crazy here. It simply means that your body, with this rise in stress hormones, that that naturally happens to everyone in the morning, it needs some sugar. It needs some fast fuel source as blood sugar levels might start to drop. So what it does, it naturally breaks down glucose predominantly in the liver, but it can also look to the muscles. Now, it can look for glucose in other places, but predominantly it's the liver, and then a secondary would be the muscles. So it is going to get it. You know, glycogenolysis is just basically the cleaving, the breaking down of glucose. And we're getting that again, predominantly from that organ, which sits under the right side of our rib cage, which is the liver. So, and this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This is why we store glucose in that liver and it's stored as glycogen. And we're able to then use that as needed. Okay. Well, that's a nice thing because the typical adult's going to store between about 90 and 120 units or grams of glucose in that liver. And that's, that's for exact times like this. Now, there's a couple reasons why this may increase. If you wake up stressed, anxious, you know, like kids are giving you a hard time or you're late for work or 
you've got a lot on your mind with a busy meeting or you're sitting in traffic, you're just stressed in general, right? That, or let's say you're working out first thing in the morning. All of this will increase those stress hormones. The more stress hormones that are typically produced, the more your body's going to call for more glucose, more short-term fuel. Because a fast fuel source is basically sugar. That's glucose. Slow fuel sources are fat, which is why fat can help us in periods of starvation. If we didn't have any food, we probably wouldn't be expending a lot of energy. Because back in the day, we would know, do not expend a lot of energy. Do not use a lot of extra movement if you have no food coming in. If you've ever watched any of those crazy reality TV shows that show people out in the woods for like three weeks, after about three days, four days with no food and there's no food in sight, what do they do? They lie down all day. It makes for a pretty boring episode, right? So they're just showing you the highlights from 21 days of just lying there because there's no food. There's no food. So your body starts to make you pretty tired as well. There's no need to expend extra energy when there's no food. And then your body starts to go to work on whatever glucose is left in that liver. And it also starts to break down fat stores. That, that's how the body works naturally. Well, on, your body's not going to produce a ton of stress hormone, that's for sure, in a state of starvation. You're already worn down. But it will every morning on a typical person's uh, daily routine. I'm not giving you the answer. I'm telling you what the body does, and I want you to think about it. If your body is naturally producing a lot of stress hormone first thing in the morning, everyone, okay, That should happen naturally. The only way you know this for sure is to literally run what's called an adrenal hormone test. It's a simple saliva test right at home or a thyroid adrenal hormone test, which gives you even more data of how your thyroid is working as well in the morning. It will look at your blood sugar and insulin too. It shows you basically how well the body's doing in terms of glucose or blood sugar regulation. I'll give you a a little test you can do right at home as well uh, towards the end of the show. So think about it. If your body naturally produces stress hormone in the morning, and it's naturally looking for some glucose in the morning. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about an enormous bowl of like fruity pebbles that I used to eat in the morning every morning. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about your body's already looking for some type of carbohydrates. Maybe 20 grams, maybe 30 grams or so. But it's looking for that first thing in the morning. Would it be a good idea to give that to the body anyway or should we just have it break down its own liver glycogen reserves and replace it later in the day? It's something to think about, okay? It's something to think about. And you'll be able to answer that, I think, by the end of the show. Now, again, this happens to every single person out there. It's just varying degrees. Again, remember, the greater the stress in the morning, the greater this dawn phenomenon. Now, let's check out the second part to this, which is called the Samoji effect. Now, the Samoji effect is very similar, very similar, okay? It's still the body breaking down glycogen from the liver, from the muscles, but for a different reason. Okay. What happens is the body in the morning falls into a state of low blood sugar or anytime during the night. So it drops into what's called hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Now I'll give you the reasons for why this happens in a moment. But as the body drops into low blood sugar, the body actually releases a couple things. One, norepinephrine and epinephrine. We just kind of talked about that in the dawn phenomenon. It can release glucocorticoids, which is cortisol. It can release growth hormone and another signaler called glucagon, which again, breaks down sugar, stored sugar called glycogen from the liver, from the muscles to bring it into the blood so the blood can then maintain a normal equilibrium or or homeostasis. And this happens often too frequently in type 1 diabetics. They haven't properly regulated their blood sugar. They had a meal that threw them off, et cetera, at night. I'll give you some of those. But this can actually happen with people who are more of the ectomorphic body type, vata-based body type in Ayurveda. It can happen with people under great amounts of stress. It can happen with maybe exposed to too cold of an environment at night and the body had to use up more energy to bring the body temperature up while you were in, in a lot of cold or the vice versa as well in a lot of heat. Here's what both do though. Both break down stored sugar, stored glucose for us to bring up the blood sugar. And that's very, very important. So what the Samoji effect does though, as well as the Dawn phenomenon, is it raises our blood sugar, which is kind of crazy. So you can actually take your blood sugar in the morning. I told you I would give you this. 
using a glucometer that you can literally, I've, I've talked about it many times. So anytime you have a question of what I'm talking about on a podcast, because I know it's, it's you know, basically 25 minutes a day, that's it, maximum, that I try to give you. But I can't give you all the topics all in one day. And so we have, what is today's show? Today's episode 1194. So if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1194, all of today's show notes and links will be there. But at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts, you can actually type in something like glucometer, which is just G-L-U-C-O-M-E-T-E-R. And this is a simple $20 item that you can purchase pretty much anywhere. I just want to make sure you get a good brand. And you'll be able to test your blood sugar 20 minutes or so upon waking, after waking. And what you're going to look for is, is your blood sugar between 75 and 95? Ideally between 75 and 90 for a healthy blood sugar. Now, if it's in the 60s, you might be dropping into hypoglycemia, okay? And that can change. That could change a half hour later if your blood sugar spikes back up due to that Samoji effect, right? So that's the hypoglycemia and it rebounds. It responds by spiking blood sugar. Or you might find you're someone 20 minutes or so after waking that has blood sugar above a 100. Now, you might say to yourself, well, it could be because um, I'm not properly regulating blood sugar or the meal I had last night. Maybe it could be. And I'll talk about that in one second. But if you took your blood sugar before going to bed the night before and your blood sugar wasn't elevated, it was between, let's just say, 75 and 95. And then you woke up the next morning and it was 120. It would not be necessarily. Now, it can be from the meal. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. But you went to bed with normal blood sugar. So it is this Samoji effect or Dawn phenomenon of your body being under stressed, under stress for one reason or another and spiking your blood sugar. Now, let me give you some additional reasons. People that are not able to properly break down carbohydrates as well because of imbalanced insulin resistance, et cetera. And again, you can fix all of these things. So don't think that you can't. So let's say that that person had a big carbohydrate meal at night. It wasn't a decent amount of protein, wasn't a decent amount of fat, just really big carb dinner. Let's just talk about like a big, pot, big bowl of pasta, right? Something like that. So they could absolutely go to bed, blood sugar's high, then they, the blood sugar drops quite low in the morning because what happens is if the body's properly functioning, it would produce more insulin and the insulin would move the sugar into the cells or it'd store it in the liver, et cetera, right? So the problem is for an improperly functioning body, the body would not be able to bring the blood sugar down well enough and fast enough and it would overproduce insulin. As it overproduces insulin, it brings all the sugar into the cells, whether it's adipose tissue for your fat or your liver or wherever it might be going, and there's additional liver that pulls too much sugar out of the blood. This drops the blood sugar. You start to get lightheaded. You start to get angry and irritable and feeling weak and fatigued and brain fog. And that can be that low blood sugar that you're feeling. Another thing that does this is alcohol at night. Alcohol can absolutely spike your blood sugar and then drop it back down while you're sleeping, which is why alcohol can help you fall asleep, but it will oftentimes not get you into a deep, restful sleep. And much of that has to do with dysregulated blood sugar as well. Plus your body's detoxifying, that liver is detoxifying all that alcohol. Another one, so these are all things to help you, right? So don't have a, just a carb meal at dinner. That's not a good idea. You don't want to drink alcohol at night. Now, again, I know most people are going to drink alcohol at night if they do drink alcohol, but try not to make it every night of the week. That's, that's a big tip, right? Especially if you're looking to lose weight, burn body fat. Alcohol is easily the most detrimental pretty much out of all of them that you could have because you're dealing with the sugar. And people who say that alcohol has no sugar, just because it's sugar alcohol, it's still sugar. It absolutely is still sugar, and it does affect the blood sugar levels. All right, another one is this. Make sure that there's some protein at dinner. Make sure there's some fiber at dinner. You want to slow the digestive process, slow that glucose spike, that blood sugar spike with dinner. Also, you don't want your dinner too large, even if it's just pure fat and pure protein, like a lot of people are doing right now on a keto-based diet or a carnivore-based diet, that can still spike blood sugar. And again, you can look up the glycemic load of a meal. A big steak at dinner can spike blood sugar. Without a doubt, it can. Uh, a whey protein shake with no carbs can still spike blood sugar. So important to keep in mind. And then also, one of the biggest ones too, is just making sure that your HPA axis is regulated. Now you might say like, well, what is my HPA axis? Think of it as this. Just make sure that your adrenals 
are not producing too much cortisol at night, which we see all the time in our practice. We see what's called a tired and wired. People wake up with lower levels of cortisol and then higher levels at night. Now, again, the levels at night are not higher than the morning, but they're maybe 75% elevated of what they should be, which means that people feel like they have more energy at night. Again, this is a dysfunctional diurnal rhythm. So they don't sleep well at night. They're producing uh, more blood sugar at the night. This is a recipe for disaster in terms of your metabolism, in terms of your cognitive ability to think and process information, to get a good night's sleep, to rejuvenate your body. It has to function as nature intended it to. Not as we wanted to, but as nature intended it to. And again, remember, there's a lot of people out there selling you a bad bill of goods that, yes, it can work on the surface. You can force your body to do things on the surface, but five years from now, 10 years from now, you'll have created literally a body that's dysfunctional, that's inflamed, that no longer burns body fat to the same level, that is just, it's not even able to handle carbohydrates anymore because you've excluded them completely from your diet. So the question now becomes, should you skip breakfast? And what I do is I always ask the question is this, for who? I hope that you tuned into my show. This was two weeks ago now. It was episode 1182. The missing factor, the one missing factor in all wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging programs that almost no expert knows. And that is that you always have to ask for who. So if you're asking me, should you skip breakfast? I would ask you for who and for how long and also how many days per week. So I skip breakfast one day per week. It's because I do a 24-hour fast. And I'm doing that from Sunday night, typically till Monday night. And I'm doing that to tap into autophagy. I'm doing that to really create a hermetic stressor on the body. But my body's healthy right now. If you're asking me, should you do it for overall health? My answer would be no. My answer would be get 12 hours in of an overnight fast. Get 14 hours in. But I don't think that we need to skip breakfast completely, especially since carbohydrates are the only thing that helps to produce those stress-busting hormones. Your body's already asking for it. If your body's already asking for the glucose or some type of carbohydrate, we can use that and not go overboard. And it's why for thousands and thousands of years, humans have eaten a very easy-to-digest breakfast. And that did not include putting gobs and gobs of fat in your coffee or cereal or any of those things. And again, this is not to come down or denigrate any other practice going on right now because a little fat is totally fine. A lot of fat, as in like 100 grams, not a good idea, right? 50 grams, not a good idea because your liver has to process all that, especially fat. So I did an episode a while back called, I was episode 761 on on the toxic flushing breakfast that has been used in Ayurvedic times for many thousands of years. And even people all around the world, they're using easy to digest breakfast. Sometimes it's a soup. Sometimes it's some fruit. Sometimes it's, you know, obviously we're doing smoothies, things like that, but it was always easy to digest. So I invite you to check out that show, episode 761. And I would simply say to yourself, should you skip breakfast? And if yes, for whole, how long? Because again, it's, it's almost a, the concept around does it have to be breakfast? What if you had your breakfast a little later in the morning? Well, it all depends on how healthy your hormones are because that could be fine for some people. Do you start the morning more relaxed? Do you start the morning not as stressed? Is your blood sugar already regulated? Are your cortisol levels regulated? And the only way to know that is to run an adrenal hormone test or a thyroid adrenal hormone test. I will link up how to do those tests right at home at stephencabral.com forward slash 1194. So again, I'm not necessarily against skipping breakfast for the right person, but I'm also not for jamming in three meals between the hours of 12 and 6. I would much rather use a more normalized approach, at least in the long run. Again, you can do a lot of programs in the short term that I think can be very effective, but I want to be careful in the long term that we keep our metabolism healthy and strong and we keep our hormones strong because ultimately that is our metabolism. Thyroid, adrenal, the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone, DHEA, all of these are built with our metabolism. So we keep them all healthy. We don't want to burn out our bodies in the short term. So breakfast, again, could be an hour after waking, could be a couple hours after waking, could be mid-morning. It all depends on how we start the day. And again, I've gone through this before. 
If you're starting the day stressed, if you're already stressed, skipping breakfast may not be the best idea for you. So I invite you to go back to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Simply type in the keyword breakfast for additional shows on this topic, what to do, what not to do. And then episode 761 for that toxic flushing breakfast. And then today, just go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1194 to learn more about using a simple glucometer right at home or running your adrenal hormone test or a thyroid adrenal hormone test to see scientifically what is best for you for breakfast. All right, take care, everyone. Hopefully today's topic was helpful. If so, please do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.